Um, just to make sure we kicked ourselves off right, I want to let you know I did steal this title from another book. So we're already getting things moving in that direction. Um, just before we get into it, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Some of you are familiar faces, but most of you who I've never met before, um, it's great to have you. Uh, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Spent most of my life there until college. I uh, went to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and studied economics and consumer psychology there. Uh, really that combination of analytical thinking and thinking about the human brain and how we react to things, those two different areas of the spectrum, is really what drove me to a career in product management. So I've been a product manager pretty much since graduating college in 2012. I uh, worked at a few different companies here and there, um, but the majority of my experience has been focused on leveraging uh, data science techniques to deliver loyalty solutions. So most of what we'll talk about today is from my time at two different companies, um, Dunhumby and 8451. Long story short, uh, Dunhumby is a global uh, company, a consulting company for retailers, and um, part of state, a part of that company was bought out by Kroger and renamed 8451. So essentially the same company throughout, but technically two different companies. Um, and then also if you're doubting as we go along that things we talk about can be applied to areas other than retail, I will just attest that I was able to take some of these same themes into work with educational institutions, hospital clients and banking clients during my time at Edge Analytics here in Louisville. I've been here at the Experience Center for about seven months now, so still fairly new. Um, this is a picture of me and my husband climbing mountains, something we like to do on the weekends. Um, so suffice to say, obviously, there's a lot we can all learn from other companies. Um, I put here a few images of logos of different companies that employ the tactics that we'll talk about here today. How do I know that? Because they either actively have a relationship with one of those companies that I worked with, or they previously have um, been very involved with that company. Um, they're from all of different sectors, grocery, food service, um, you know, actual clothing retail, home and auto, um, all different things you think of electronics. Um, and then also, it's not just in the U.S., so Tesco, as one example of many uh, retailers across the world that leverage these same techniques. So, we're going to kind of go through a few different topics here, different levers that retailers employ to um, generate better business operations, generate better profit, and generate better customer loyalty. So first thing is the most obvious lever that most retailers will pull when they're in trouble. So if sales are declining or they're seeing negative customer perceptions in the marketplace, um, the first thing that retailers will do is look to their pricing strategy. Is there a place we can take prices down so that we will drive customers to come in our doors instead of our competitors? classic sort of Walmart strategy, right? Like how do we have low, low prices every day? Well, the problem with that is that if you try to invest in lower prices across the board, eventually you get into a price war, your margins will be really thin, and you become unsuccessful in the long run as new entrants come in and can put you out of business. So really what you have to do is be smart about where you put those price investments. Instead of doing it all across the board, find the right items that actually react to price changes so that you start there. So across the top of the screen here, you see a few different um, little images, fake little graphs, if you will, um, representing different elasticity principles. So if we're trying to understand where a, better, a, where a dollar is better spent in a price decrease, we might want to understand how is each item going to react to a change in price. So with this example, we have cigarettes, which are fairly inelastic items. People are going to continue to buy cigarettes despite prices going up. Demand for cigarettes may go down a little bit over time, but it's one of those things that people are going to continue to buy. Maybe they're addicted, they love the habit, whatever it is, they're going to continue to buy it. Beef, on the other hand, is an example of a product that has gone through a lot of price changes in the last few years. Uh, we saw a few years ago a huge increase in beef cost, so therefore the price being passed on to the customer was a lot higher. So as beef prices increased, what we saw is a lot of sales going down in the beef market. Simultaneously, they're buying less beef and they start buying more chicken. So 
So that's the idea of cross elasticity. So what is the change in price on one item? How does it affect other items that are in the same category? Another example of cross elasticity of something that maybe doesn't interact quite as well as chicken and beef is tea and coffee. So if you're a tea drinker and you're not a coffee drinker, a change in price is probably not going to push you to all of a sudden take up drinking coffee. So you see that as the price of tea gets higher, it would take a really big price jump to get someone to switch to buying more coffee. So if we take all of these ideas and think about it on a whole, on a much bigger level, we can actually crunch the numbers and use machine learning to generate demand curves for each category in a retailer, whether that be you know, men's slacks at a Macy's or whether that be the soup category at a Kroger. So you can essentially create a demand equation that allows you to scenario forecast, if I set each of these prices for my different products in this category, what are going to be my category sales at the end of the day? And then you can do that over and over and over again until you've optimized the results that you're looking for. High units, high profit, you know, whatever it is that the business goals might be. The last thing before I would have moved on from this topic is really <coughs> you have to also make sure that you're putting that customer lens on top of it as well at the end of the day. So sure, maybe we find a product that if we um, price that really high, it's going to generate a lot of profit. Well, we need to look at the customer level to make sure that we understand what products are really important to price sensitive or low income shoppers. Those are the people that are most budget constrained. They're the people that are most likely to look at a weekly ad and decide where they go to shop. So they may not come visit you at all if the price of your bread or milk is not competitive with the, another store. So essentially, most of the retailers that are doing this well are creating a list of must win items where they price those items within five to 10% of the competition no matter what the you know, algorithms might say they should do. The next lever that retailers <coughs> typically employ is looking at assortment. So as you may or may not know, um, there's always a fight to have new items on the shelf, um, to put in less items in the store, <coughs> the store whose size is shrinking. Um, so essentially it's a common thing. Some retailers go through assortment changes once a quarter. Some do it once a year and do a huge overhaul of their stores. It's always happening. Some of your favorite products may get delisted, which is what they call it, removed at any time throughout the year. Um, so in this space, in order to make sure that we're making really good assortment <coughs> decisions, we first look at some of the higher level sales metrics. So it's really common to say, OK, well, the soup category is declining year over year, but beverage or beans or something else is growing. So we want to allocate more space in the store to the growing categories, and so therefore we need to cut some of these areas that are shrinking. So okay, we understand that we need to make some cuts in the soup category. How do we decide what to cut? You could very easily just look at the sales volume and the sales changes um, in each of the items within the category, but you might delist something that's really important to people. So you have to go one step further and actually run an analysis of how people are actually shopping across these categories. So we have a toy example here of what you can call a, a basket analysis, a shelf review, what have you. Um, so in this case, it's four different um, checkouts or visits to the store. And we've got a Campbell's soup and we've got the other guy's soup generic um, product. So first, what we can see at large is that Campbell's is selling more. But we knew that already from the sales analysis overall. If we imagine though that these are four baskets from one single person, you can start to conclude some things. These two things are probably substitutes for one another. If I can't get Campbell's but I really want soup that week, I may as well just settle for the store brand or another alternative in the category. So knowing that it's a substitute tells me a lot of things. I could get rid of that other item and I would still probably have sales about the same because I would just have this customer buy more of Campbell's soup instead. However, if we saw that instead of this representing one person's four trips, if we saw that this was more representative of how people shop in general and you had a lot of people's baskets who look like this that never buy Campbell's, 
you might need to be careful that you're not going to remove an item that has a really small but loyal following. It could be a regional player, it could be um, you know, some high-end choice, or maybe it's a value brand that's really important to your value-conscious shopper. So you have to really do your due diligence and not just make cuts without thinking about not only the sales impact, but also the customer impact here. And the final thing on assortment, um, this is a pretty common set of terms that you'll hear. Uh, retailers are always trying to make sure that they have a good, better, and best option at all times in every category. What does that mean? Um, so a good item might be an entry level, generic product, maybe it's a store brand that's priced really well. Either it's on a low price every day or it's got um, you know, frequent deals on that product. Then you would have a sort of middle tier product which might be like a Campbell's, you know, everybody pretty much buys it, it's a good product. Um, uh, it has a pretty good price, maybe it's sometimes discounted. And then finally, a best product. So your premium item that appeals to more of that foodie shopper or what have you, it has some sort of special attribute that merits paying a more premium price. Having these different tiers ensures that you're going to appeal to a broad swath of different types of customers. Next, okay, so the next thing, moving on from some of the operational types of concerns that retailers are using data to help inform what they do, um, we really start to think about what do we know about our customers. It is not uncommon um, to approach a retailer and ask them, okay, who is your target market customer? Or a consumer packaged good company like a P&G. You know, who's your target customer? They might say things like, oh, well, she's between 25 and 30, and you know, she makes this amount of money per year, and she really loves putting on makeup every day, or whatever. It's this sort of ethereal, um, idealized version of one single particular consumer. Well, the reality is we have a lot of diversity of the types of consumers that exist out there, and there's no single way to define them. So what do you do? You start running a series of segmentations to try to understand the different types of customers that you have. And through those segmentations, you can start to create a DNA of a single shopper using different segmentations that they might fall into. So just to walk through a few examples of really common segmentations in this space. Uh, first, we start with the loyalty one up here. Um, essentially, this is an example from grocery, perhaps. I made it up, so it's not real. Um, on one axis here, we've got um, how much do they spend each time they come to the store with us. And then over here, we have uh, the number of visits that they take in a given week. Um, some of you might go to the grocery store once every six weeks but spend a lot of money. And maybe others of you go two or three times a week because you know you got a busy life and you forgot something and you have to go back and do a fill-in trip. So we want to take into account those two things. And then the business will decide some you know, way to bucket those into loyalty groups from most loyal, loyal, somewhat loyal, and then not loyal at all. Maybe they come in a few times a year and don't spend very much with us. So once you have that, um, keep this one in mind. We'll, we'll come back to it quite a bit um, in the next few slides. We then think, like to move on to um, product segmentation. So OK, we know how loyal you are to the store, but what is it that you like to buy? How do we know um, what you might want to hear from us if we were to reach out to you, for example? So in this fake example, um, we've run a clustering analysis across all the different um, people in our population and what they like to buy and how that um, naturally can form some patterns. Sorry if you're blue, red color blind, this might be hard to see. Um, we have, in this example, come up with four separate customer groups. One is a foodie, maybe they are really into fresh and organic items. One is a world flavors group that might be really into eating um, ethnic food and really shop that sort of international aisle space. One is a quick convenient shopper who really just wants to pick up something and microwave it and be done with it. And then finally, more of a traditional households type shopper who, you know, purchases a pretty balanced diet, probably cooking for a big family, focuses really heavy on the meat and potatoes aisles. The other set of examples down here I'll just run through really quickly. These are fairly common um, across retailers as well. So price sensitivity, um, we sort of alluded to that earlier, but you know, how often is a given person changing what they buy 
based on there being sales available in a given aisle, or potentially they have a coupon on an alternative, so does that drive them to change from the Campbell's to an alternative if it's better for their wallet that week? Um, coupon usage, fairly explanatory, but how many coupons do you use? Do you use paper coupons, digital coupons, ones from the retailer, ones from manufacturers, that type of thing? Um, digital engagement score is a pretty common thing that we're seeing more lately. Um, so how often are you coming to the website? How much time do you spend on the website? How often do you visit the app? Um, low digital coupons if that's available through the retailer. Um, are you opening emails, clicking through emails? The next one is category specific segmentation. So very similar to this idea of product segmentation, um, it might surprise you to learn that um, retailers actually will do this on a smaller scale as well. So let's say that Kroger is looking at reinventing the beverage aisle. They might run a product segmentation just on categories in the beverage department, <coughs> specifically to see how they need to be changing their strategy in that aisle. Are there people who are diehard soda lovers and buy no other types of beverages? Are there people who buy water and sparkling water? How, what's the trade-off between sparkling water and soda? And just trying to get all these dynamics, where does juice play into that with the kids? So are there groups of people that are buying a lot of diversity or are there people that are loyal to like only certain subsets of the category? And then finally, brand loyalty. I um, thought that was kind of an interesting example. So sometimes you will have buyers who actually make the products like a Coca-Cola or a Unilever actually commission studies to create brand loyalty uh, analyses for their particular products to understand what are their key competitors, how are people shopping between those competitors, how do people shop across their brands if they own a portfolio of products, that type of thing. And then finally, while we always try to start with the data of how are people shopping, you know, you are what you eat kind of thing, it's really important also to layer onto that once you have a segmentation, some primary research. So if you have, this is how we know you <coughs> cluster based on how you're shopping, we can lay on top of that how do you feel and how do you feel about the said retailer. So like, wouldn't it be great to know if foodies really didn't like shopping at Kroger because they didn't think that they had enough of a particular type of high-end something or other that was really important to them. So you could find out something by talking to them about their attitudes, what are unmet needs, and those will differ certainly by the different groups in your segmentation. Okay, now that we've established our segmentation, we've got good pricing, we know that we carry good products in the store, we start to think about how do we start to generate more loyalty with the customer base that we have. And let's spend a little bit of time talking about why that's important. It might be self-explanatory, but it is extremely difficult to convince some of these executives of these companies that this is an important thing to think about. It's very easy to think about spending money on attracting new customers. Yeah, we can grow our customer base by 10% if we do XYZ campaign. Well, while you were over here distracted by trying to get new customers, look at all these customers over here that you've lost because you weren't making sure that you were meeting their needs and they got attracted by some other retailer <coughs> or some other brand if it's within a retailer. And maybe you switch from Revlon to Maybelline. Um, so loyalty is a really important thing to keep in mind. We always thought about it in terms of it's the world's like a bathtub. You can focus on filling your bathtub with new customers to try to raise your um, level in your tub, but if you don't have a plug in your drain, then you'll lose customers. So you may not grow at all, you may lose out, you may grow but only a little bit. You're essentially limiting your growth in one way or another. So you have to create loyalty schemes that will plug that hole and keep your existing customers retained year over year before you then think about adding new customers because then and only then are new customers truly incremental to your business. So some stats that we use to help explain to executives that it is really important to do this. Um, it actually may or may not surprise you again um, to know that loyal customers spend anywhere from 8 to 12 times more than a non-loyal customer. And the non-loyal customer we've already defined, right, like they do visit you, just not nearly as often as the loyal customer. Um, and then also, it's really a lot easier to get someone who's already shopping with you to spend more with you than they did before, than it is to spend a lot of money to get someone to spend even one dollar with you. Uh, 
Um, and then that can be that can be measured essentially by how much does it cost to attract different types of customers through marketing campaigns. Uh, what we saw in my experience is essentially an average of a four to one return on your investment for marketing dollars spent towards low customers versus you're lucky if you break even trying to generate campaigns to non-loyal customers. And it can be as expensive as $15 to get a new customer to spend even $1 with you. So where do you want to spend your money at the end of the day? So what now? Okay, we've bought into this idea that we need to generate loyalty with customers. We've got some segmentation. We know how our customer base is overall. Well, really, you have to go one step further than that. And maybe it's one step too uh, conservative. You've got to go a few steps further than that. Here's an example. This is made up entirely um, of what a retailer like these retailers we're talking about might know about you if you shop there. So this is Sally. She's approximately 30 years old. How do we know that? Well, she probably provided us some information when she signed up for a loyalty card with us. Or if you don't offer loyalty cards, maybe we know some information um, through her credit card company. Because that is something that credit card companies typically sell about you, is your demographics. Um, she does most of the shopping for her family. How do we know that? Because it's her loyalty card that we see scanned more often than not compared to her husband, who we know is in her household because he shares her address and her last name. Even if we didn't know that she had a husband, we would be able to discern from her purchases that there is a man in her home and that there are kids in the home ranging anywhere from, we guess, about one to five years in age. How do we know that? She's buying <coughs> men's and women's deodorant, and she's buying men's and women's razors. So there's a man in that house, and there's a woman in that house, or it's possible she's buying it and giving it to a neighbor. Unlikely, but possible. Um, and she buys diapers, food, etc., for the aged children that you know fall into this age range, one to five. We know that she drives past another competitor to shop with us, which makes us really lucky because location is a key factor in deciding where to shop. How do we know that? We've done some geospatial analysis. We have her address. We know where our stores are. We know where the stores of our competitors are. So we can heat map exactly how far people are driving to get to where we are and what they're driving past to get there. We know that she visits the store twice per week and spends about $20 per week on average. This is just straight from transaction data that we have, similar to some of these other examples here. She makes mostly traditional meals, <coughs> but skews heavy in the fresh department, really likes Italian food, and buys a bunch of baby items. She uses anywhere from five to 10 coupons per visit and buys on deal whenever possible. So she is price conscious. She would probably be in that um, price sensitive uh, segment we were talking about earlier. She visits the fuel center once a week, spending $45 per trip. How do we know that? Because she uses her fuel discount, swipes her card when she's there. And she subscribes to beauty and travel magazines. Well, that one's kind of weird. How do we get that one? Well, there's, it's always possible to purchase data pending services from companies out there that do things like sell magazines. So that's really common. Um, Peachtree and others offer this type of service. Um, there's other ones like um, the National Change of Address that the post office offers, so you can ensure that someone you're about to mail hasn't moved to a new address recently, they haven't passed away is another sad one, um, so that you're you know, constantly keeping your lists up to date. Um, you can purchase information from other companies. And they essentially do a match with your data, and you can then append the data that they have about the same customers that you have using things like name and address and date of birth. Okay, that's a lot, right? It's a little creepy when you look at it at this level. Good news is, no one's really looking at it at this level. This is just an example to bring this home of like, these are all the things in the database that somebody could have on any one of their potentially 60 million shoppers. So that's a hugely rich data asset. And why is it important? Because it gives us a window to what's relevant to her. How do we create a relationship with her, talk to her on her level like a friend would, instead of, oh, here's our mass marketing campaign where everybody gets the same thing. Every single one of us in this room can have a unique message sent to us because of what a retailer knows about us. And that's gonna give us a reason to shop there instead of somewhere else. 
So here's some examples of how this actually manifests. Using Kroger is pretty relatable. We all go to the grocery store probably, or our wife does, husband, whoever in the home. Um, so using <coughs> the data that retailers have on you, they're able to not only select whether or not you should receive a particular communication campaign, they can tell what you should receive that's going to elicit the best response from you. What is the response? Even just coming into the store next week on your regular routine is a response. Redeeming a coupon is a response. Buying a sale item that we showed to you is a response. These are all the ways that uh, retailers are measuring whether what they're doing to connect with you is working. So um, provided some examples here. I actually have physical copies if anyone is curious to look. I do get these. I know how to game the system. Um, so this right here is a magazine format, and it is variably, variably printed. It's a patented technique to actually print magazines that are personalized for people. So Macy's does this, Kroger does this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because we know what you buy and we know what's relevant to you, we can select from a pool of content and send you the content that's most relevant to you from the pool that we have available. We're probably only going to send it to our most loyal customers, so there's that segmentation coming into play. But then when we decide what to send you, we're looking more at your individual household behavior and sending you an article for healthy eating tips if you buy a lot in the fresh department or you're one of those foodie folks that really buys natural organic, you know, what have you. Or maybe we send you a kid's lunch article if we know that you buy a lot of kids' products. And we may even go so far as to actually put the cover on the front to be different so that it reflects the content that's inside that's relevant to you. So immediately when it comes in the mail, you're like, huh, this is for me. This is great. Um, another example is um, variably printed coupons. So I um, have a few examples of that as well. I'll pull one open here. <coughs> Looks like I used one already. Um, but essentially there would be, uh, I was going to say I think it's 12, but I think it's actually this one's 14. Um, there are 14 coupons here. Um, it goes from highest value coupons here that I see first right when I pull it out of my mailer. There's a free one Cascadian Farms granola any variety. That's the cereal that my husband buys. So it's immediately relevant to me. It's immediately something I can connect to. The next one is $3 off $15 or more in the frozen department. Buy a lot of frozen pizza and meal kits. And the list goes on. Um, so it goes from most valuable to then like what are my most individual, individually relevant products, all the way down to maybe trying to get me to buy something that I haven't bought before. Like I don't buy a lot in the natural foods department. That's the last one that's on this list. So. Why is that important? Again, I can shop anywhere I want. There's a reason for me to shop at Kroger. Not only have they given me coupons off for things that I like to buy, they've just made the effort to reach out and be in my face, say, hey, don't forget about us, we're here. We appreciate you. And a lot of times these things they send even say that. Cheers to you. Best customer bonus. You know, the messaging is really all about them appreciating me as an individual, as a shopper to their store. And it benefits me. You know, yeah, it may be a little creepy, they're analyzing my data, but I'm saving money because of it. Because they're sending me rewards. And then the last thing, just to hammer it home, um, it's obviously a lot harder to pull this off in the direct mail space. A lot of people think direct mail is, you know, old news. It still drives the best results, by the way. Um, however, it's a lot easier to do this on a massive scale in the digital sphere. So um, if we have a bank of 10,000 coupons or 2,000 sale items, we can very easily create algorithms that will score every product in terms of relevancy. And when you pop on our website, you will immediately be shown the most relevant sale items for you, which again, this is a screenshot of my view. There's that cereal again. That's Gideon Farms. Um, I used to do those every time we go to the store. So I immediately know what are the sales that are happening at Kroger this week that are relevant to me. They will pre-populate my list, my shopping list, if I go to use ClickList, for example, 
with the items that they've actually predicted that I'm going to buy in my next visit. So if I only buy um, Philadelphia cream cheese once a month, they're not going to show it every time I log in. They're going to show it when they know I'm about to run out of it. So it's smart enough to know that. So that is the majority of the content I have today. I'm going to leave you guys with one more parting thought. Um, so in addition to being able to use data to have better operations, to connect with customers better, more meaningfully, um, these companies are also really pushed to find new ways to define revenue streams. It's something that most businesses have to think about. Think about Humana. We've reinvented ourselves a number of times over history because of what's been happening in the industry. These companies are monetizing their unique assets. It's really hard to make profit on grocery items. The margins are like razor thin, like 2%. Um, so if we have unique assets like our data and access to a specific set of customers that we know a lot about, we can use that to our advantage. So these companies, you know, there's a retailer at the center of a huge universe of a lot of suppliers. Those suppliers have money to spend. So these retailers make extra money, they make extra profit by selling their unique assets to suppliers that connect with them. So in the Kroger example, like Unilever and Coca-Cola, they <coughs> pay Kroger to participate in these mailers. So it's not Kroger fitting the bill for all these coupons that I'm seeing. It's actually the brands themselves say, hey, I want to participate and I want to make sure that I retain that customer. And then, oh, by the way, some of them I know you're going to send to people that don't really buy my product all that much. So it gives me an opportunity to be a stretch item for some people. They will pay to participate in these things, and they will receive closed loop measurement on the back end that says exactly what kind of ROI that coupon or you know that article <coughs> featured in the magazine or a recipe, what have you, how that has drive their business. Because that is something that's really hard for companies to get their hands on. It can be really hard to measure one-to-one -one what has actually happened as a result of the marketing campaign. And then the other way that these companies are making business is offering reporting tools. So most of those companies on the front page have a way that suppliers can pay to have access to a software tool that will allow them to run reports to see how many people at the retailer are buying their products, what kinds of people, what segments are buying their products, what products are going in the basket along with their product. So they might see that people are cross shopping with a competitor, or they might find some sort of other complimentary item that makes sense to run a promotion with. Think hot dogs and hamburger buns, you know, hot dogs and buns, hamburgers, et cetera, et cetera, condiments, what have you, you can make a whole meal by finding some of those things out that might not be obvious. Um, again, never know what you have till you work what you've got. Um, so that's most of what I had to talk about today. Any questions? Happy to take questions. Any part? This one comes to mind because I think I'm probably an outlier in this area, which is, uh, it might be in the store layout dimension. But my, my patterns inside the store are probably highly erratic compared to the normal person, especially by a lot of time to kill. <laughs> and it's mostly because I'm disorganized. Do they, uh, they study videos of movements inside the stores? There's a, a number of ways that um, people get at, you know, are things improperly placed in the physical store. Um, there is some heat mapping analysis that can be done. There's uh, companies out of Europe in particular that focus a lot on this, like using the video in the store to map individual people throughout. Um, if you're local here, you might have heard of um, U-Scan as something that Kroger tests here. It's not everywhere. Um, they use that specifically to generate heat map. It pings your GPS location inside the store um, as you're walking through the store and what you pick up. And if you end up having to go all the way back to the beginning of the store to pick up something you forgot, they might be thinking about, well, hmm, should we dual place that item here and right before checkout? That type of thing. So yes, that does happen. Okay. So you said you've been uh, at now for seven months. Yes. So I would love to hear um, what kind of interesting parallels from your previous life that you found now with healthcare. So, great question. Um, 
The easiest corollary that I can come up with is the Humana Pharmacy is at the end of the day a retailer as well. It would be, you know, assuming it's legal, I'm not an expert in the legal area in healthcare specifically. Um, Assuming it's legal, it would be very easy to monetize sales reporting on, to a Pfizer or other drug manufacturers on, you know, these are the types of people that buy your products. These are the types of people that have, you know, these particular set of diseases. These are the trade-offs they're making on price because, you know, your price went up this amount. Here's who they're switching to, that type of thing. Um, and obviously we know that there's some level of segmentation that's done in our shopping. Um, experience, but it can almost certainly be more. Um, the other corollary would be, um, you know, looking at the claims data and trying to figure out, you know, what are other patterns there. You know, are there unused benefits that folks um, have access to that we could, you know, market to them about it. Um, Viper is set up for success um, eventually to take on some of this more predictive science in the future, knowing. You know what your interests are, maybe what your previous healthcare plans were. Now, what's the healthcare plan we should recommend for you next year? How much should you be saving in your HSA based on what we know about your um, claims from last year? That type of thing. So there's a lot of examples. Um, I'm sure this is the reason that I wanted to do this was because I'm sure there's more examples you guys can come up with in your day-to-day -day business. Uh, this is more out of curiosity than anything that has to do with Humana, but. Um what was, uh, in your experience, the discrepancy between like age generations in terms of what they liked to receive, what they didn't receive, how they were utilizing different coupons? Like, did you, was it much uh, higher utilization for older generations compared to like, millennials or Gen Zs? Or I'll blow your way? mind. There's no difference. Really? I'm surprised. So that is one of the things um, that's truly beautiful about having all of this data. So when someone comes to you and says, my target customer is this age and this gender and this, this, and this, it's like, well, did you actually know that 40% of your shoppers are great? <coughs> and you're like, oh, that's bad. Why is that bad? You've made a sale to that set of customers. We just need to change your thinking a little bit. You know, maybe your marketing is not hitting home with that customer that you wanted it to or what have you. So in general, when you look at these reports of particular campaigns and you slice by those things, the not the segmentation that we were talking about that's like behavioral based, but the segmentations that are, you know, demographic ranges, gender, um, even to some extent the product segmentation does not necessarily show silver bullets for who's interacting best because people are much more complex than that. Guys, I'll stick around and you can come up and look at my things if you like.